Shall we play a game? Let's look at some tarantula private parts. Hello tarantula lovers, I'm Alex and you're watching Tarantula Haven. If you're a tarantula collector, I'm going to show you why you need to invest in a microscope now. Determining gender is always an underlying issue when buying a tarantula because males have shorter lifespans and females of course live longer. This can be especially true if you're buying a more expensive tarantula. If you're throwing down a bunch of money on a sling and it matures male in about a year, then you can't help but feel cheated, especially if you're just buying it as a pet and you don't intend to breed it. If you're a serious collector and have the money, you can pay premium prices for a confirmed female. Or if you would just rather avoid the whole waiting game and know exactly what you're getting. I know I've paid for a few confirmed females myself. If you're like me, however, I like to buy a few slings at a time. Sometimes I buy a few slings of the same species and raise them up. Um, this is rewarding to me because I get to see the different stages of development that the tarantulas go through and I learn as much as I can about them. I also intend to breed, so it's become very important for me to know the gender of my tarantulas so that I know what's what. This way, if I confirm a female, I can set her aside for my future breeding stock, and if I confirm a male, I can either make future plans to breed him to a female that I may have, or I can send him off for breeding and free up some space in my menagerie that I have here and possibly get more tarantulas. This brings me to what we're doing today. If you have a larger specimen, determining gender can be very easy, but if you have a sling or a juvenile, then determining gender can be very difficult. That's where the use of a microscope can come in very handy. Buying a professional microscope is very expensive and pretty much out of the question and not necessary for most of us. Fortunately, there are many USB microscopes to choose from that pretty much do the trick and won't break the bank. These microscopes can be hooked up to your computer or your cell phone via a USB cable and can be powerful enough to see small details necessary to determine the gender of some of your smallest tarantulas. The one that I purchased from Amazon is a Muscam USB microscope. It hooks up to Windows, Mac, and Android devices and has a 10 through 300 times magnification. With the included software, I can take pictures of what I'm viewing and even record 1080p video that I can share with you. I chose this one because it had a pretty high magnification and I liked the stand and pad that it came with. I paid about $40 for it. A little disclaimer here, this is not a paid advertisement nor am I endorsing this product. If you search on Amazon you can find several different USB microscopes at different magnifications and different prices. My suggestion would be to look at the reviews and see which one you think is best for you. So this is what the microscope looks like set up and um, you might have seen it on my thumbnail. The base is actually really heavy, so that's a good thing and holds it in place. You've got this um, arm that goes up or this pole part and then the arm that attaches to it which you can use it to adjust the height of the microscope uh, from the surface. You've also got this little round circular area that holds the microscope in place, but the microscope can also function by itself. You can remove it from this arm and the entire setup and just use it handheld, which works pretty well as also. Um, in fact, some of them are sold without all the extra stuff, just the handheld portion. So that's completely up to you how you want to use it. Now, as far as the software is concerned, I'll show you a little bit about how that software works. Um, right here, I have it set up. And let me adjust this so that you can see it clearly. And as I go through here, you can see how, uh, how well it magnifies. You're talking about a very tiny ruler there that I have in place. And I'll show that to you. And I can take pictures and I can also record with it. And when I record, it doesn't save it directly into the same area. You have to click on video to see where the uh, video is. And it saves it in AVI format, which of course is usable um, if you wanna create videos and things like that, like I'm doing here. And it's got this tiny little ruler here. I don't know if you can see that, but it's got measurements on it, I think two inches. So you can use that for measuring stuff. I don't really use it. And it does come with a pad. Um, this pad is very similar to a mouse pad. It's just like a mouse pad and it has a light side, 
and it has a dark side. Yes. So depending on what you're magnifying, what you're looking at, you can choose whichever surface is, is best for you. Now, as far as the pad is concerned, um, it does have some give to it. So it kind of makes it a little bit difficult to get the right adjustment on the microscope because sometimes when you're moving the microscope, you might be pressing down on the pad and then as soon as you let up on it, it loses focus. So what I like to do is I use a piece of plexiglass that I put underneath it, especially when I'm working with molds, which is exactly what I use it for. So I don't use it for anything else. So this plexiglass kind of gives it a hard surface. It serves very similar to like a slide when you would use a real microscope. So this way I can put my, my molt on there, I put the water and everything else that I do and just kind of flatten it out on this plexiglass. So that makes it a whole lot better for me. So before I get into it, I wanted to let you know that I'm not gonna go into the whole um, how I prepare a molt before I start looking at it, um, especially when it's a dry molt. Uh, if you want to see that, I do have a video that I've done previously up here. And in that video, I go into detail as to how I go about preparing a mold so that I can look at it under a microscope. So definitely check that out, especially if you want to know or you don't know how to set up a dry mold. And um, if you want to go check that out and then come back to this, that way you'll know exactly what I'm doing as I go through this. Because to save time, um, you know, I just don't want to get into all that. I've already done it and I'm just going to go straight into checking out the molds. Also, before you start trying to determine the gender of a molt, it's a good idea to search online for the particular species that you're, that you're looking at and do a search for that species and then the word spermatheca afterward. And you'll usually pull up a bunch of pictures of spermatheca that people have taken of that particular species. And that will help you determine what you're looking for when you look at your mold, because that way you have a frame of reference. Um, there's a lot of good places to find this stuff. The arachnoboards is one of them. There's also the tarantula forum. They even have libraries of spermatheca for different species. Now, some of them may have older names on them, but if you know those older names, you can figure it out. So let's turn this into a game. What I have behind me here are several molts that I've been holding on to that I want to determine the gender of, just so I know what I have. And I've been kind of putting it off, so they've been collecting right here on my shelf. And um, I'm gonna go through those and look at each and every one of them and see if I can figure out whether they are male or female. So what I'll do is I'll lay out the molt, pause the video, let you determine whether you think it's male or female, and then I'll reveal the answer afterward and see how many you can guess correctly. So for the first molt, I chose something easy. This one's a little bit larger. It's a juvenile Pliltocat albopilosis, which is the curly hair tarantula. And I'm gonna display right here. This is what the spermatheca should look like if it is a female. And um, hopefully we'll be able to see this pretty clearly. And I'm gonna go ahead and set it up. And let me spread these out just a tad right here. And what we're looking at is we're looking for the first two uh, the first, what they call the anterior book lungs right here. You've got a second pair down here. The anterior ones are up here. Those are the top ones. Those are the ones closest to the sternal area, the sternum area. And you're looking in this area right in the middle right here. So let me sop up some of that moisture there so you can see it a little bit clearer. All right, and I'm gonna pause the picture right here and give you a chance to determine whether you think that this is male or female. And if you said female, then you would be absolutely correct because right here in the middle, you can clearly see the spermatheca and you can see they're almost like little Mickey Mouse ears right there. And if I catch one and flip it, you can see how I can flip it up like that. That is a perfectly textbook spermatheca right there. So yeah, pretty easy to determine on that one at that particular size. Now, younger ones are a little bit harder. Let's move on to the next one. The next one might also be easy. This one is Nandu chromatis. And this one is a larger specimen. This one is about four inches. 
and um, there is what the spermatheca should look like. So let's dig in and take a look and see what we've got. So I'm going to go ahead and spread this out a little bit, center it in the microscope there, and sop up some of the extra moisture. All right, pause the video. Is this male or female? Once again, if you chose female, you are absolutely correct. Now, you can't get any easier than this one. That right there is your spermatheca. These look like little, little ears. And I can try to flip it up. It's a little bit harder to flip up. I'm trying to rip them all here. All right, so it's kind of hard to flip up there, but yeah, you can flip it up. Uh, you can almost see a little bit of a clear flap around the spermatheca. That is known as the uterus externus. So um, you have a very good view of all the parts right there. So most definitely female. I'm kind of happy because I didn't know that up until this point. So this is Salmopius cambridgei. And this one is about a four inch specimen, so kind of big. And it shouldn't be too difficult to determine the gender, but I haven't sexed it yet, so I need to know what it is. This is what the female spermatheca should look like. So let's take a look and see what we have. So right there are the book lungs, and the area you want to look at is right in here. I keep poking it, I'm sorry. This is a little bit tight there. So um, yeah, if you want to take a look there, I'm going to pause it right now and you can determine whether you think this is male or female. If you said male, then you are correct. So if you notice here between the two book lungs, there is nothing inside here that is, resembles anything of the spermatheca. All you're seeing is just a little white ridge there and everything else is pretty much flat. There's nothing there that I can flap over or move. Um, you have two little dots up here, but that's normal. That's not anything that determines gender. This is the area you want to look at, and I am not seeing anything there. So that is a male, and that's good news because that means that I can breed um, Meg Mucklebones again. Next up is Pacillotheria rufolata. Um, this one is also about a three inch specimen. Uh, it's been my experience that most of my pokies have been very difficult to determine their gender. And uh, this is what the spermatheca should look like. It's kind of like a paddle-like structure. Um, this is what is referred to as a, as a fused spermatheca. Um, in most cases, you have two segment, segments to them that look like little bunny ears or they look like Mickey Mouse ears. In this case, it's just one single paddle-like structure. So let's take a look. This one is also got a small abdomen, very similar to the last one we did. So I squeezed in a little bit tighter. And there is the, what is called the epigynum, which is this, the middle part right here. And um, there's your anterior book lungs. So let's take a moment to look at this one real carefully. And what do you think this is? Now, honestly, I want to be hopeful and I want to say that this is female, but I'm not exactly 100% sure. Like I said, this is small and from what I can see, I'm not seeing a whole lot of structure there. However, I do see this little area right, get that off of there. I do see this little area right here that almost looks like that little paddle structure there. And I'm trying to flip it up, but I'm having a hard time doing it. But I don't know if you can see that, the lights are kind of messing with it, but right there at the tip of my skewer, there is a little thing that sticks out that looks like a paddle. And that's what I'm going by. I'm thinking that this might be female. Oh, I just saw it flap. So I am gonna call this a, oh, there it went. There it is, 
is right there. I just folded it over. There it is. So I am going to call this a female right there. It's hard to see, but that lets me know that this is a female. All right, so we have a female. That's good news because I haven't sexed any of them yet. This next one is a Fisilotheria metallica. And in my experience, this has been probably the most difficult one for me to determine so far. Um, here's an example of what the spermatheca should look like. And this one is about a three and a half inch specimen. So let's take a look and see what we have. So there are the anterior book lungs right here. Let me get the other one in place. There we go. All right, so let's stretch this out. Okay, so let's take a moment to decide, is this male or is this female? If you said female, then you would be correct. Now, I know it's difficult to see and you have to be really, really knowing what you're looking for, but right here, you see these two little bumps. See them there? And those are the spermatheca. And they are very small in the P. metallica. So that's why they're so difficult to sex because they're extremely small and you really have to be careful and not miss them. So you can see a little bit better there. They look like two brownish spots right there. She hasn't quite sclerotized. What that means is that uh, when their spermatheca sclerotized, that means that it hardens and it turns a reddish brown color. And that means that they're ready for breeding. So this is a very young female. So that's why they're so difficult because they're almost translucent before they sclerotize, before they become sexually mature. So this one is a very young female. Okay, so this is actually the next day. Um, last night it was getting pretty late. Uh, it was past one o'clock and I decided I needed to go to bed. I just left everything the way it was and I figured I'd pick up today. So it's broad daylight outside and you'll probably hear my birds making noise in the background because this room still isn't all that soundproof. But um, yeah, we'll just pick up where we left off. So um, the one I'm doing today, or the one I'm doing next, is the Orphanacus philippinus. And this is a smaller species anyway, and this molt's a little bit small. So it might be a little bit hard to see what we're, what we're looking for. So this is the example of what the spermatheca should look like. Now let's take a look at what we have here. Okay, so I'm gonna spread this out a little bit, and it kind of ripped its molt, and I was hoping I would have enough material left. You see the rip right there? And I'm gonna spread this out right here. There's the two book lungs that we're looking for, and I will pause right there and let you decide if this is male or female. And if you said female, you are correct. Right here, you can see the two sper spermatheca right there. They're very visible, very textbook. So this was not a difficult one at all. Um, I'm surprised. Actually, she's getting pretty good size, so I was kind of suspecting, but I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised that she is a female because I've been wanting a female of this species. And for this one, I'm going a little bit smaller. This one is the Lycatheli diamantinensis. And for reference, that is what the spermatheca looks like. For such a small species, they have a very large, very visible spermatheca. So this one should not be hard to detect. So let's take a look. Let me spread this out. So we can get a good look at it. And this one's a little bit ripped right there. All right, so there we go. There's the spermatheca. That's the uh, epigynum right there. There's the book lungs. So I'll pause a little bit and let you figure out if it's male or female. And if you said male, then you are correct. So as you can see right here in the epigynum region, there is absolutely nothing there. It's completely flat. So 
I've been wanting a male. My females are getting pretty big. I haven't had a single male mature out. So this might be my opportunity right here. In fact, this guy had molted just recently. In fact, he molted while I was starting this video and I haven't checked on him yet. I just pulled the molt out. So I'm anxious to see if he's matured yet. And this one is also Delicothelia diamantinensis. And um, this is from a younger specimen that I have. So it left me such a beautiful molt that I decided I wanted to see if I could see something. It's probably maybe an inch and a half. So it's, I guess, reaching that juvenile stage. And I zoomed in extra tight because it's so small, but the molt was just beautiful, to, too beautiful to pass up. So let's take a look. Um, I'm not gonna move it around because it's already set up perfectly. I'll give you a moment to determine whether you think it's male or female. And if you say male, then you are absolutely correct. I don't see anything there that resembles spermatheca. And uh, even if it hasn't sclerotized, I think we would probably see something because I'm zoomed in pretty tight and it looks relatively flat and plain. I don't see anything in there. So I'm gonna go with male on this one. And uh, that's pretty good news because I know I've got some females in there and uh, that will give me future breeding stock for those females because this is younger and it will grow up and these will be ready to, to breed. And I had yet a third Delicothelia diamantinensis that molted recently. So I figured I'd put this one on here as well and let you take a look at it. So it's already spread out. Give you a moment to determine whether it's male or female. And if you said female, you are correct. So this one is an example of a female. You can see the spermatheca right there. They look like little bunny ears. There's one sticking out here, and there's another one that's not quite sticking out. That might just it might just have gotten stuck back a little bit because it was dried out. But you can clearly see it right there. Long little bunny ear stuck behind the uh, uterus externus there. So um, it does appear that she is sclerotized and ready to breed. So if I have a if I have a uh, mature male, I'm definitely going to try to breed these. Okay, so this one is Terina Pelma Sazimai, and this is a small juvenile, about three inches, and uh, this is an example of what the spermatheca should look like. So I'm going to give you a moment to take a look at this one and determine whether you think it's male or female. And if you said female, you are correct. Now, this one was probably the hardest one that I was able to, to sex. Now, I'm gonna zoom in real tight, just to show you. Um, this is an example, this is a prime example of why it helps to have a microscope, because if you were looking at this with the naked eye, you probably would not be able to determine the sex on this one just yet, because this is a very young, tarantula and she has not sclerotized yet so if you look closely you still really can't see anything as far as what is there if you're if you've got a trained eye you probably can but if you're just looking with the naked eye you probably would not see it now of course we're looking right here and if I press down you see that little flap that comes up right there that is the uterus externus, and right below that are the very small spermatheca. So it's very difficult to tell, and I had to look really, really close before I could even be sure. There it is right there. That's a beautiful shot right there. You can see the whole thing. So she's pretty young. The uterus externus is very um, translucent. And of course, the spermatheca are right there. They look like little bunny ears. So that was a tough one. That was really difficult to tell. If I had not had my microscope, I would have gone another few months before I could ever tell with just the naked eye. So this helps me know right away um, what I have so that I can already start planning or making plans for her future. Isn't that amazing? Some people like to keep their molts. I don't, <laughs> I just throw them away. 
Um, if you have a few tarantulas and you like to keep track of their molts and what stage they're in and all that, that's great. But I have too many to, to worry about it. I don't like keeping these things around because of course some of them have urticating hairs and I don't want to get that in the air or anywhere in my room. So if I check them, then I just toss them in the garbage. But pretty cool as far as the microscope is concerned if i didn't have that microscope i probably would not be able to tell on some of those i know that with my um, p metallica i i was never able to determine the sex i did better determining it ventrally than i did by looking at it with the naked eye on the um on the molt now with the microscope it helped me out a great deal so it's definitely worth the investment if you have a whole lot of tarantulas that you want to keep track of and know what's what so you can plan what to do with them so last week i asked you guys to give me some help as far as whether i should keep my old logo or whether i should go with my new logo that i had designed and your comments really helped me put things into perspective and really helped me out as far as what i should do there's one particular comment that really stood out and drove things home, and that is by Reiner Kerner. And I'm gonna to read to you what he said. He said, to be dead honest, when I heard you were changing your logo, I panicked thinking I'd lose my favorite part, the swirly eyes, haha. <laughs> the old one was great because it always gave me the old Halloween goofy plastic spider vibes. And as others pointed out, the simplicity makes it easier for printing, watermarks, and monochrome. The new one, however, isn't that much more complicated and will work just as well as long as you made sure that the red, orange, and purple were still distinguishable as different colors when desaturated. Both are still whimsical and help make them far less scary than some of us are taught to think, which is something the poor critters really need to win over the hearts of us arachnophobes, and to me that's probably the most important part. Whew. I got a little bit misty-eyed there. I had to cut out for a little bit. That comment really did touch me though. Um, when, when I read that comment, it really drove home as to why I created this channel and why I created that logo in the first place. When I first started this channel, the whole purpose behind it was to provide education and pretty much demystify all of the scary things about tarantulas that people hear. And I wanted them to become more acceptable. I wanted to help out the pet trade as far as the tarantulas are concerned. And, you know, just to, to basically have people not look at them in such a negative light. And when I created my logo, I had that completely in mind. I wanted something that was friendly. I wanted something that was not your typical tarantula in a threat posture. And I wanted something that was not scary so that people wouldn't view them as these horrible creatures. So yeah, and, and this really drove it home. It really reminded me as to why I created that in the first place. So those of you old logo fans, the old logo is going to stay. And I'm gonna get rid of the, <laughs> the new logo. Um, I might tweak the old logo just a little bit, but not anything significant that's gonna change it in any major way. But yeah, sometimes you just need a little reality check. You tend to forget some of these things as you move along. And uh, that really drove it home and, and gave me a big reminder. Thank you so much for your feedback. It really helped me out as far as making my decision for my logo. And if you have several tarantulas and you wanna know what's what, I highly recommend getting yourself a microscope. I hope I showed you the, the value in these things. They may not necessarily be super high quality, but they're very affordable and they're powerful enough to do what you want them to do so that you can look in there and determine what you have. They really help me out and I know they can help you out as well. And that wraps it up for me today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give me a like. If you wanna see more, subscribe. If you wanna support this channel, I have a Redbubble store where I sell tarantula Haven merchandise. Any of the proceeds from the merchandise will go directly to help grow and support this channel. Until next time, keep loving them tarantulas.